Michael Montgomery is an existential psychotherapist and clinical social worker and has practiced and researched psychotherapy in four countries. And he's done it in private and public settings. He specializes in complex trauma and emotional, extreme emotional states, drawing from existential psychoanalytic and dialectical approaches to support the healing. He's a regular contributor to the Society of Existential Analysis. He is also an ordained Buddhist. Michael lives in Boston and is also a candidate at the New School for Existential Psychoanalysis. You've gotten to know him a bit this week and I think we'll all be incredibly delighted with what he has to share. Are you ready for a bit of rock and roll? Yep. I uh, was a little bit nervous following John Mills until I saw Daniel last night and then I knew he had to follow Daniel. What an evening. Incredible. <laughs> so, a bit of advice, I would probably buckle in at this point. Yeah, I'm serious, just buckle in because this is going to take you on a bit of a journey. Uh, this talk was pre-written, so the synchronicities that you experience were not written afterwards, right? It's all locked in, so stay aware. So I, I wrote this before I had met all of you, so I was sort of visualizing what it would be like to be in Esalen. So it was, it's such an honor, privilege and dream come true, not only to be finally with you at this conference, but also to have some time to share a few thoughts and experiences. From a Hegelian point of view, I've been not attending this conference for about 10 years. Um, John will explain that to you afterwards. Or rather, I have wanted to be here each year, and it has not disappointed. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to get to know you all and sort of many journeys all over the place. Quite, a, quite an incredible experience. Um, if I truly wanted to reflect my own creative spirit, uh, authenticity, I would offer just one line from Artie Lang on treatment. I would throw my papers in the air and I would head to the hot tub. But in front of such luminaries, thinkers, brilliant clinicians, friends, colleagues and admirers of Ronnie Lang, what possible line from that body of work would I have the audacity to select? Well, it's this one. The heart of the matter is open-heartedness. The heart of the matter is open-heartedness. Papers in the air, let's go to the hot tubs. <laughs> but he said a little bit more. He said this, only by the openness of one's heart to those who come to us as patients can we expect their hearts to settle down? From the varieties of terror and trepidation, consternation and panic with which they bring with them. Wow. So I would like to explore a very simple idea that humane or compassionate treatment of others can be healing. I want to share with those of you old and new the profound influence of Lang's work on my understanding of treatment in the mental health system in its broadest way. I will draw from encounters around the world with a particular focus on extreme states or psychosis. My main argument will be that the vision of treatment, his vision of treatment, is as vital in the 21st century and poses a legitimate challenge to biopsychiatry and the McDonaldization of care. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you on a sort of bit of time travel here uh, back to Belfast, Northern Ireland, in the 1990s. Yes, I am that old. I had my existence. I was there, me in place, and the place in me, Seamus Heaney. I was a child of the Troubles, the armed conflict that raged from the 1970s to around the end of the 1990s. I was a deeply sensitive and empathetic child, but after 21 years of living in these conditions, I was on the verge of being killed, killing someone else, or killing myself. Then something really curious happened. 
I was visiting a friend that I met in the north of England and she invited me to a rave. She said she would be taking a pill called ecstasy and asked would I like to try it. The experience I had could only be described as the blowing open of my heart. A sense of connection beyond egoic consciousness and a deep sense of love that I had never felt before. One of the lyrics at the time, uh, from the music of the time was, it's like a new emotion rushing over me. And that was the experience. So back in Belfast, I found my way onto the underground rave scene where Protestants and Catholics were hugging and connecting on the dance floor for the first time. Uh, how do you conceptualize that? It would be like uh, supporters of Hamas dancing with the Israeli uh, defense force. That's the magnitude of this. Um, and much to the concern of the paramilitaries that supposedly represented them. Ironically, or magically, the high quality ecstasy or MDMA that most people were taking was referred to as white doves. It had a white dove stamped on it. A coincidental allusion to the peace process that was about to commence. So it was at an after party where I met a man called Peter. In the early hours of the morning, he told me his story. It was a magical story full of myths, legends, and archetypes. He was an uneducated working class Republican who shared his story of geometry, Greek gods, rolling dice with the devil for his soul, and astral time travel. He used to, he used to put drugs on the top of books, uh, like speed, and the next day when he ingested the drugs, he would believe that he had all the knowledge contained within the pages. It's kind of wonderful. He believed that the earth was tilted at the wrong angle. With insight into true geometry, he had plans to correct this and to bring the world back to a more peaceful and harmonious time in history. So he was a compelling Shanaki, which in Irish means Irish storyteller. He had the delivery of a custodian of oral wisdom. That was the experience. However, what really caught my attention uh, was when he told me that he used to risk his life going into police stations to tell a story. So that would be like somebody who supported uh, Hamas going into uh, you know, a, a, an Israeli sort of military complex. He believed that only a Freemason would understand. His logic was sound. Symbolic ge uh, geometry was a central component of Freemasonry. And a significant number of policemen were among, among their brethren. So he made the link. The only people could understand were people uh, in the police. I knew this because unknown to anyone at that party, like my father, his father, Oscar Wilde, and W.B. Yeats, I was a secret Freemason. It was my first experience of earth-moving synchronicity. In fact, it was Peter who introduced me to the concept. As if the oral commentary wasn't powerful enough, he got up off his seat and left it a painting. And the painting was, on the back of this painting, he had sort of created imagery to support the story that he uh, told. It was in incredible. Um, so a combination of the times, the drugs, uh, as Timothy Leary would say, set and setting, made the whole experience sort of shamanic. To be sitting with an enemy in this way was dreamlike. So at the end of a few hours, he told me something truly shocking. He had been incarcerated for three months against his will in a hospital. His crime, apparently, he told the widow of his best friend at his wake that he could bring him back to life. What he told me next changed the course of my thinking in my life. He said that at no time during the three months had anyone asked him his story. I just couldn't get my head around the treatment of someone so fascinating and lucid. Oscar Wilde lamented, and the wild regrets and the bloody sweats none knew so well as I, 
For he who lives more lives than one, more deaths than one must die. So fast forward about 15 years, <laughs> past uh, many adventures and near-death experiences, I ended up in London. And I was on a social work internship on a community mental health team. And I felt absolute despair from witnessing the coercive medicalization of human suffering. These were virgin eyes. That was my response. Through my eyes it was brutal. I became organically anti-psychiatry. Samuel Beckett wrote, you must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. So I desperately sought answers from outside my course's curriculum. I stumbled across the newly republished biography, R.D. Lang, A Life by his son, Adrian. It was like seeing the light. If you've watched the brilliant movie, um, Silver Lining Playbooks, uh, when the character throws his copy of Hemingway uh, through the window, well, I literally threw, about halfway through the book, threw it down and walked to Kingsley Hall from uh, where I was living in East London. Such was the uh, inspiration, which was a fairly dangerous thing to do because there was a lot of gangs and stuff. But I was sort of standing and I go, yes, <laughs> so something was unleashed. Right? I devoured and saw the whole system in a completely new light. What inspired me so much was primarily Lang's idea that treatment is basically how we treat others. It was just like, oh, this is just so makes so much sense. He gave relevance to compassion and care over coercion and control. It was not some far from the 60s, but rather a fresh term of treasure planted for me to discover and share with others. I stumbled across another book that had a profound influence, Post Psychiatry. Mental Health in a Postmodern World by Pat Bracken and uh, Philip Thompson. Phil so, Thomas. Hmm? Phil Thomas. Phil Thomas, thank you. So, through this book, I was turned on to the phenomenology of Jaspers, the phenomenology of psychopathology that did a great service in organizing the form of psychotic symptoms, but in, pro in the process, it excluded the content. It was an epiphany. I finally realized why the hospital was not interested in Peter's story and why even the exploration of form was discouraged. People were ignored in the belief that talking to them would exasperate their psychosis. Have you ever heard anything as negating as that? When you need human connection and touch more, you're being ignored. I can't pronounce this. I think it's atheogenic to its core. To its core. As Bertram Caron argued, psychosis without psychotherapy was a tragedy. Treatment without understanding. So uh, Lang, thankfully, jumped off the page because he did the opposite. Not only did he listen and try to understand, but more importantly, or most importantly, he believed. Post-psychiatry also introduced me to the hermeneutics of distress and hermeneutic phenomenology through the introduction of Heidegger, a philosopher that I've been trying to get out of my life ever since, <laughs> with no success. My colleagues respected my passion, but the older ones, some of them were up here, were aware of lying, were not convinced. One crack or coup at the time, a lot of things came together, depending on your view, was the increased awareness and attention to the Garrity model, uh, cognitive model of positive symptoms of psychosis. So there was a little opening, right, a potential opening. A senior clinical psychologist actually presented it as, as the future cure of uh, psychosis, which is fascinating. But what it did bring in was a, a flicker of hope uh, against the bio dominance. So at the time he uh, was sympathetic to my zeal and he took me and a colleague to a day trip to a rural abandoned asylum where he used to work. He shared stories of the abuse that he witnessed and he urged us never ever to let this happen again. 
So, uh, I went from a state of despair to an amped activist wanting to make the concept of post-psychiatry a reality. I honestly felt that Lang was my mentor and my guide. We share many deep connections together, and this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I am from that curious tradition of Scots-Irish. My parents remain devout Presbyterians, and I would have intimate knowledge of the damage that a shaming parental style and double bind can have on a sensitive child. Pushed to grow up and become independent, but criticised when for being too confident when you do. So although they never met, my father uh, studied theology at Glasgow at the same time uh, as Ronnie was there. He, Ronnie was much better educated than me. I left school at 16. I didn't do my first uh, undergrad until I was 34. Uh, we both served in the British Army. We both trained in the, uh, the Tavistock. We both worked in the national health system. Uh, he was a keen meditator, as I have been for about 25 years. He was attracted to the Hindu god Kali, I believe, which is my wife's uh, family's god. He had a relationship and connection with Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, who I still consider one of my earliest teachers uh, from, from books, a long person. He gave talks at Esalen. <laughs> uh, I'll skip over the connection with women, alcohol and drugs. Uh, <laughs> so this team provided me the confidence to think critically about treatment, mainly others' treatment. I had witnessed the carnage that the liberal use of neuroleptic medication was having on vulnerable people with little or no voice in their care. The devastating impact of rapid weight gain Acesthesia, dystonia, Parkinsonism, tremors, lactation, and lethargy. And that was, remember, that was with through virgin eyes. That was like me trying to work out what I was seeing. It reveals something really important to me, that those who are labelled mad might not look the same as the average person. How could they with that shit pumped into them? Ronnie whispered, these are not the effect. These are not the side effects, these are the effects of the medication. It was like waking up in a nightmare and realizing you no longer have to face it alone. Insanity is a minority of one. Wherever I was in the world, I made a point of writing to Peter once a year. Every Christmas, I would send him a card adorned with a white dove on the front, a symbol celebrating our still dangerous cross-community connection. He told me once that it was the only Christmas card that he ever received through the post each year. Mm. In 2008, fearing that he would be once again sectioned, Peter took his own life. Mm. What treatment did he fear that would be worse than dying? Well, having seen the loss of liberty and agency at the hand of the state-sanctioned health care system, I began to understand. Through the realisation, though the realisation did not ease my devastation. In addition to involuntary admissions, I witnessed what were called community treatment orders. Basically, you comply with a depot injection of a slow release neuroleptic or you'd be returned to hospital. It seemed no coincidence through virgin eyes to me that these orders appear to be particularly frequent in those already marginalised in the community, the socially disadvantaged, often from BPOC and immigrant communities. At the time, the psychologist Richard Bentle made an extensively researched case that social deprivation, disadvantage and exclusion in London were the biggest predictor of psychosis. His work was also a source of much inspiration. But inspiration is nothing without the action to accompany it. I knew I had to get skin in the game. I already had a disadvantage, having an Irish accent, and clearly not from a grammar school background. Additionally, I realised the lead psychiatrist would exclude people from serious discussion of treatment by the use of exclusive medical language. So we read it well, it's the same in, in America, but they, they have ward rounds where the patient has to come into the room uh, whereas if you're in, be in a bed, uh, you know, 15 people come to you. So 
this terrible experience of these people shuffling in this room and the room the kind of semicircle of interns and psychiatrists and social workers horrendous so I purchased a copy of the Oxford Dictionary of Psychiatry and read it over the weekend. With two, within two weeks, I was now the first person to be called in a war round by the Leeds psychiatrist. And that was a, on an internship. Some, sometimes with as many as 10, 15 people in that room. My new ability to use the lingo gained me access to the club. I was able to finally advocate fully on my patient's behalf. Those who were hastily labelled incoherent were often in fact hilarious and on point if you only took the time to realise that because of the heavy medication they were one answer to a question behind. Mm. Speaking up for the strong young black men labelled aggressive by the irritating middle class psychiatrists who wielded their power. I work creatively to restore a sense of humanity towards those dishevelled beings often shuffled in to a den of thieves. I remember the look of disbelief on the faces when I asked the lead psychiatrist to indulge me as I placed a ghetto blaster in the middle of this ward round. Everybody thought I'd lost, lost it. I pressed play. You can picture the scene. The angelic tones of a cover version of The Look of Love bellowed out, much to the puzzled faces and giggles of my colleagues. I stopped it and I said, that is who you're going to see next. It wasn't much, but it was something. Love is all you need. Lang helped me understand more deeply the injustice and lack of care in the system. When I reappraise what he was highlighting, I find the work of Miranda Fricker and her concept of epistemic injustice really helpful. I've already mentioned my experience of the undervaluing of my professional voice and potentially the patients that I represented due to exclusive and excluding language. Fricker breaks down the concept of epistemic justice into two important categories, testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice. Testimonial injustice is when somebody's word is not trusted or ignored because they have been labelled, labelled psychotic. Hermeneutical injustice is when someone's experience is not well understood because they don't fit any concepts known to them or others. So they get suppressed, silenced, ignored. So uh, thinking a bit, it gets happy, it gets cheerier. Go on. Don't, don't worry. There's a happy ending, I hope. Thinking a bit more technically about what Lang offered me, I would organise it under three main themes of understanding the treatment. Contextual, existential and relational. These are sort of my categories to try and give you what I got out of it. So, contextual understanding opened the door to social intelligibility. It went way beyond the spurious and reductive idea of simply a, chemically, a chemical imbalance. Lang argued that psychosis cannot be understood without understanding despair. Whilst wishing to avoid romanticization, just reflecting on the possibility that psychosis was a way to make the unlivable situation livable, he created a powerful paradigm shift within me. He argued that the signs and symptoms are more socially intelligible than has come to be supposed. This opened the door for me to see the links between trauma, loss, heartbreak and psychosis. Where he veered into the subtle areas and dynamics of mystification, deception and invalidation, I was confronted with the overwhelming impact of childhood, emotional, physical and sexual abuse on the psyche. Not a lot of people might be aware of this. Freud also arrived at this place as evidenced in his unredacted letters to Fleiss when he discussed the intrinsic genuineness of infantile trauma. He went as far to propose a new motto for psychoanalysis. What have they done to you, poor child? Of course, he, he, he well, I won't get into the, you know all about what happened next. Psychosis is a holy human experience, a human experience in trouble. Lyme launched me into a relationship with early complex trauma 
and the relationship with adult distress. So this is my opinion. Clinicians get so confused when they approach psychosis. They forget that emotions have a logic of their own. Complex and enduring trauma brings attention back to the body. When activated, there is no point telling someone it isn't real because their body is saying otherwise. We are wired to perceive and respond to threat. It is very, very real to the body. And until the body believes it is no longer real, the mind cannot process that it may not be true. The emotion, the logic, the real and the true. Not one, not two. People in distress need people and places who can offer safety. Think of the treatment of Peter and others in the system. People in distress need places that offer safety so that the body can begin to find out what is real before the mind can take it in. So the existential understanding, when considering the existential understanding of treatment, the influence of philosophy on Lang needs no introduction. You've heard a lot about it this week. But he refined my understanding of phenomenology further. He described it as an attempt to release our minds from the bland, uncritical attachment to any set of miserable meanings, right or wrong, true or false. And his attention to the contextual or environmental impact on the patient addresses many of the criticisms of Gadamer of phenomenology, it's hard to say. Perhaps the term social phenomenology needs to be amplified in order to demarcate the power of Lang's reading. The contextual and existential understanding of treatment shifted my overarching questions to the patient from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you to help me understand what that experience is like for you. It shifted deeply my relatedness to others in distress. So, the relational understanding. And finally, when considering a relational understanding of treatment, Lang taught me the centrality of really listening. To be willing to encounter the pain and suffering that is universal. To let it breathe. The influence of Harry Stack Sullivan was evident in his approach to the most complex and hard to reach patients. He demonstrated that they were much more human than otherwise. I use the metaphor to describe his approach to the clinical encounter as the willingness to sit on the floor with others. In the Dzogchen tradition there is a saying, the higher the teaching, the lower the throne. He demonstrated how not to hide behind the role of the professional but to bond in our inevitable existential givens. Many people can listen, but Lang showed me the part of also believing. He believed the despair, the terror, the angst that people shared. He did not simply pathologize it away. He said, psychotherapy must remain an obstinate attempt of two people to rediscover the wholeness of being human through the relationship between them. He argued that there were lots of technique in his approach if you only took the time to study it closely. Later in his life, he discussed in more detail his concept of relatedness or co-presence. Not one, not two. Highlighting the interplay between the intrapersonal, interpersonal and transpersonal. He described a meditative conversation, not going into separate word, worlds, the sense of a shared experience, a coming together in a reflective mood, an unspoken communion, perhaps a communion of love. In the moment of love, our empty essence dawns, allowing the transpersonal field to be recognised. Mm. Mark Nuttall, who analysed this period of Lang's work, proposed that he countered the lack of love and ethics in the scientific framework of psychiatry 
by attempting to combine the science of the heart and of relatedness. You can still watch Lang in action at well in many contexts, but in a conference in Arizona, engaging with Christy, a homeless woman labelled paranoid schizophrenic, a most personal encounter. Bono, Jimmy Bono is, he's like Jesus and Aaron. He said, you gotta cry without weeping, talk without speaking, scream without raising your voice. I pose the same question that Lang asked in every group that I run. Where in society can you go to scream? I offer an invitation into a space where people don't fear the possibility of being sectioned when they disclose their most intimate fear and pain where they can scream back into the world. Lang gave me the confidence to do so. So, a bit more about the, the journey, taking all the, the Lang in. Um, so I ended up in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I met some of the most incredibly hospitable and friendly people I've ever met, with quite possibly some of the best food, as you can see, in the world. <laughs> Whilst less intimidating than living in England, it did require an immersion experience in a vibrant culture, or more accurately, cultures. I witnessed the relationship between people in distress and indigenous healers. For some it offered relief, and others it prolonged access to more sustainable care. My cultural conditioning was challenged daily, from encountering seemingly strange and superstitious practices to government schools being closed at the sight of hungry ghosts. But I remained open to learning. I volunteered in a busy mental health NGO, and it was my first experience of polypharmacy. I offered the patients the chance to bring in their medications. They brought medications for each ailment and medications for the side effects. Supporting people come off the meds was probably the most powerful intervention that I witnessed. I remember people telling me that they thought someone was putting something in their food. As paranoid as this sounded, Lang had taught me to listen and to believe, just as he had done with the soldiers who had told them they were taken from their beds and beaten at night. I kept exploring. Another member told me the same thing. I asked the head of the NGO what they thought. Without hesitation or blinking an eye, they said, Yes, we are putting the neuroleptic medication in the food. This is what the drug companies told us to do. And please don't tell anyone because I'm also doing it to my son. My position became untenable when I left. I witnessed beautiful and unique people being pathologized, medicated, ECT'd for underachievement, gender fluidity, sexuality, or just being different. The pervasiveness of Western scientific ideology and the grip of big pharma on information was not a conspiracy, it was a fact. So I supported, I moved on, I supported Malaysia's version of Doctors Without Borders, developing a psychosocial pro program for first responders. There was a lot of tsunamis and the like. Um, I became vividly aware of the existential crisis that arises in even the most religious devotee when faced with disaster, and orangutans, incidentally, when their habitat is destroyed, and the pervasiveness of secondary trauma, regardless of religion or culture. I moved on, I worked with Protect and Save the Children, supporting people face the unimaginable horror, witnessing and holding trauma became a specialism, but psychosis remained a passion. And they drink, both me. Okay, I eventually returned to England and I was determined to research early intervention and first episode psychosis. I was pumped. I thought I knew something. My first, <laughs> my first uneducated research proposal was 10,000 words. Such was the passion for change. I joined an early intervention team and was immediately met with the reality that my dream of offering innovative and compassionate treatment was shattered. I witnessed even more coercive and lack of care than before. I was shocked by how much medication and medicalization was taking place. Where was the love? 
people were being medicated for the mildest of drug-induced perceptual changes, referred to as lazy because they were coping with enough meds to medicate a horse. I quickly realized that no one on the young team had any experience of psychedelics, but they could make pronouncements on what was and what was not a hallucination. At a team meeting, I asked for the details of the Hearing Voices group. The lead psychiatrist bellowed out, It is the job of this team to eradicate voices. You bet. The team leader, a social worker, was meant to be the psychosocial dialect to the medical model. But he was in collusion with psychiatrists. Therefore, no alternative could get through. My dream was crushed, and I did not think I could ever tackle the power of psychiatry and left to focus on further clinical training. So having trained at Regents University for many years, including a whole term with the late great John Heaton, I became disillusioned with the British existential elitist disavowal of psychoanalysis, and with it the concepts of transference, counter-transference, and yes, even the unconscious. So I had a personal invitation to be a candidate on a new forensic psychoanalytic training in the Tavistock in Portman. John Heaton said that Lang felt the Tavistock was soulless. Despite deep pockets of brilliance, he wasn't far wrong. It was a broad spectrum, like Peter Fonicky, some of the greats, and Alessandra Lemma at one end, and people that I would not want to be in a room with alone at the other. Toward the end of my training, a beast of a supervisor berated me for not using enough psychoanalytic lingo in my case presentation. I thought you mean like narcissistic, narcissistic enemy, I wondered. <laughs> they said I was a storyteller, telling stories about patients' lives. It was one of the most validating things I had ever heard. <laughs> yes, I thought, this is exactly what I want to be. I want to be a shanaki. I want to be a storyteller. I want to give voice to the voiceless to help people think the unthinkable and say the unsayable in safety. I believe that creating spaces where they could do so was the treatment, was the essential healing. I wanted to witness and I wanted to give birth to their pain. I wanted psychoanalytic language to support this process and not hinder it. The abuse of jargon can let a cold, compassionateless clinician hide behind the veil of silence or unresponsiveness. My patient, who she referred to as a pervert, in the most derogatory and not clinical way, came from a Middle Eastern background and wrestled tragically with his own sexuality, despite enjoying the freedom of London. Lang taught me not to divorce him from his context. His behaviour became so much more intelligible, much more human than my supervisor had supposed. So, uh, I took the best of what I experienced at Tavistock, I moved to Hamburg, Germany. I had the most curious experience of seeing many German patients that preferred to experience psychotherapy in Belfast English. One of the most demanding and interesting aspects of being a travelling mental health profession well, is often the expats and locals will seek your support in extreme circumstances outside the consulting room. From sudden and tragic deaths, to wild teenage acting out, to crazed adult extramarital behaviour, the impromptu role could sometimes feel closer to that of a parish priest. The good, the good type, obviously. Whilst in Hamburg, a man phoned me in the middle of the night and asked me to help his wife, whom he thought was going psychotic. When I met with her, she explained in heartbreaking detail that she recently had told her long-term lover that she loved him. He immediately broke off their tryst. Her broken-heartedness was palpable. She got a little bit worse before she got better, and they asked me to rendezvous with them in a local psychiatric hospital. As I drove into this intimidating campus, I became increasingly adverse to the dark Gothic architecture and was imagining all sorts of horrors inside. I called the couple and met them in the canteen. They had the same visceral response, and the three of us chuckled at our shared dilemma. 
The raw humanity in that moment was palpable. The irony of the situation was we took the decision to proceed with the meeting and the psychiatrist conducted one of the most compassionate and contemporary assessments that I'd ever witnessed. Through various other encounters, my faith in psychiatry increased mildly. I shifted from a position of anti-psychiatry to that of anti-bad psychiatry. <laughs> so the next country I moved to, Chicago. Uh, yes, country, because when you're from outside of the US, each state can feel like a, a different country. Different pizza, different ways of driving, <laughs> varying levels of uh, friendliness. Um, and while I was there, I completed a significant piece of research into the clinician's use of silence. I interviewed seasoned practitioners that collectively held over 900 years of experience. In addition to their contemporary relationship with silence, what really fascinated me was their retrospective perspective on what they now believe was the most healing aspect of treatment of patients. More or less universally, it was the focus on the needs of the individual patient and the moments when they were able to convey actual care. It's kind of so obvious when you think about it. Often drawing from Winnicott's theoretical shift from an emphasis on interpretation to that of the relationship, presence and holding. I was so inspired by their approach and absolute dedication to their patients even after decades of the f in the field. Despite choosing to stop using the couch and having a strong existential sensibility, I retained some degree of reservedness in my clinical practice. It was the way I was trained. I almost, uh, I admit, you know, I was often looking for the psycho, uh, psychoanalytic theory in my patients instead of, a, you know, letting the phenomenological theory arise in sort of a collaboration. So having taken a sabbatical to complete the research and following much reassessment, I decided to consciously test the revised approach, distilled from the experience from my research participants. The first, ex uh, the first patient experienced the new me. Metaphorically, and in the shadow of lying, I got on the floor with my patient. I was more real and creative and explicitly caring than I had ever had the confidence to be. In the words of Oscar Wilde, be yourself, everyone else is taken. I've never looked back. So now I'm living and practicing in another country, Massachusetts. Domino's Pizza in Boston is the only area in the world that lets you put raw chopped garlic on their pizzas. <laughs> it's an Irish thing. I can explain that to you afterwards. Uh, in one of the most cutting edge areas for medicine, biotech, robotics, psychology and psychotherapy, I would like to bring you good news. Well, I can bring you some good news that the agency that I am in uh, has an underpinning, evolving philosophy that prizes compassion, care and autonomy for the patient. There is kindness in our agency and a high level of contemporary professionalism. I am afforded ample freedom to develop treatment approaches to complex trauma and psychosis. There are emerging spaces where the open dialogue approach, if not delivered with fidelity, at least offers spaces where alternative voices are able to be heard. So the bad news is, I am once again moving towards becoming violently anti-psychiatry. <laughs> the prevalence of polypharmacy way exceeds what I witnessed in Malaysia. The prescribing of high doses of neuroleptic medication accompanied at times by lithium, a powerful antidepressant, depressant, a benzo, a stimulant, and of course a few pills for the side effects. It beggars belief. It challenges all common sense and flies in the face of practice-based evidence. When challenging senior psychiatrists, I'm often met with the defense of big pharma sponsored research. It's safe to give someone with psychosis a stimulant, they will argue, they have drunk the Kool-Aid. I would like to pass a new law that stated no prescriber could suggest a drug cocktail that they did not first try themselves. Right if, if anyone protests, are you trying to kill me? 
I will retort, I will retort with, are you trying to kill the patient? The medical model is so entrenched, so pervasive, big pharma has its tentacles everywhere, and our patients deserve, at the very least, to hear an alternative, critical, informed voice. On paper, the consensus formulation of psychosis may be biopsychosocial, but in reality, the bio dominates a perceived clinical hierarchy. Therapy, if you are lucky, is but an add-on. Taking aside any arguments about the efficacy of medication, the singular focus can raise attention to the social aspects of racism, injustice, oppression, exclusion, trauma, stigma, and a lack of social resources. There isn't time to talk about the coercive and controlling aspects of biofocused treatment that are still very much in existence today. But the growing dominance and focus on the bio in psychiatry and psychology leads me to believe that Lyme is as relevant as ever. The other reason I think he remains relevant is the rapid growth of the McDonaldization of psychotherapy. It's a sociological term developed by George Ritzer, Donna Dustin, and some guy called Montgomery. And it's basically the process in which the foundational principles of the fast food restaurant are embraced in all aspects of our society. The prevalence of the four core dimensions of McDonaldization can be seen across all sectors. Efficiency, predictability, calculability, and control. Examples of which can be found in Starbucks, Walmart, Disneyland, universities, gyms, as well as human service agencies and professional bodies. The four dimensions could be summarized by the management slogan, if it's not measurable, it does not exist. The fifth dimension of McDonaldization is the irrationality of rationality. The unforeseen consequences of attempting to impose order. And most importantly for psychotherapy, these can manifest as dehumanizing, de-skilling, de-responsibilizing, I think I can't remember that one, and disenchantment. The name of the person of concern has shifted over the years from patient to service user to member to client. I find myself returning to the use of the term patient because it infers a general suffering and the necessity of patience in effective treatment. Patients can be another major casualty of McDonaldization. Insurance companies and agencies don't really want therapy. They want quick solutions to problems, formulated to medical necessity and trackable by tick box software. A perfect accompaniment to the codable categories of the DSM-5. Patients are being conditioned to seek the same quick answers. So, what's the antidote to McDonaldization? When faced with the McDonaldization of therapy, what is the antidote on treatment and healing in the 21st century? The heart of the matter is open-heartedness. Returning to Lang in the original quote taken from the approaches film with Harold Searles, I do believe that viewing patients or people not as problems to be solved, but as beings to be personally encountered, is at the heart of existential sensibility and part of the antidote to the commodification of care. And I don't think it will emerge by fighting the power of psychiatry and big pharma head on, but actually sidestepping it with a more grassroots, bottom-up approach. I have an ever-growing network of connections with people who want to explore a less pathologized approach with or without medication and medical framing. Lying continues, the way each person must take to emerge from their nightmare is unique. In much of my initial work with people experiencing psychosis, I will be in the realm of dreams or indeed nightmares. This is a sacred space and I am but a guest in their realms. The words of Yeats' famous poem are always front of mind. I have spread my dreams under your feet, 
Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. The wonder and awe of dreams are hard to McDonaldize. The realm of linear causality has been transcended. The desire for a quick fix by the patient be, can be somewhat alleviated by the powerful experience of true, personal and sympathetic encounter. Of being with someone who can bear the nightmares and look into the abyss because sometimes it looks back. Lang continues, it is, the it is this movement, the movement that they are already taking, which one must intuitively sense, so that, essentially speaking, all one has then to do is to remove whatever obstacles one has the capacity to remove in order that the movement can happen and to trust it. He speaks of uh, intuition, of sensing, of movement, of collaboration, of trust, of some sense that the patient knows what they're doing. It speaks to their autonomy and potential for regaining agency. Movement, in my opinion, is closer to dance, is closer to artistry, is closer to that which cannot be manualized. I have gratuitously peppered this paper with Irish artists. All have informed and guided my path. But it is James Joyce who, I believe, converts the bread of everyday life into something that has a permanent artistic life of its own. Does that not speak to the form of therapy that cannot be McDonaldized? In a long forgotten book, The Existential Core of Psychoanalysis, Avery Wiseman conveys the picture of the analyst who understands that the here and now of existence is far more nuanced than any precarious generalization that we may try to attribute to it. We are in communion with our patients, in relatedness, enmeshed in existence. So I'll do a sort of hard stop breaks on uh, conclusion. At the new school of existential psychoanalysis, we talk a lot about the current state of psychoanalysis and the endemic dullness of its output. This is supported by much detailed critique and research by senior members of the faculty and it can sometimes paint a disheartening picture. However, I like to think that sometimes a flame burns most brightly just before it's extinguished and I would boldly propose that perhaps that flame is existential psychoanalysis. Very much in the lineage and indebted to the late great Ronnie Lang, an approach where the common sense, compassionate, caring, creative treatment of others is at the very heart of what is deemed healing in the 21st century. because this, thank you, this is incredible. No words, I want to experience it and open it up to everybody. I'm just jumping for joy, my brother. Thank you for your courage to be who you are. And um, there's so much to say, so much to say, but thank you, thank you, and just, and I just, I just, I don't know, there's so much to say, but one thing I want to say is that I, I really appreciate you valuing rave culture and giving that some legitimacy because that's so often the psychedelic experience is sort of seen as, um, you know, not not properly done in the underground among people in the music scene, and raves are kind of put down. And I think that's just I don't know. I, one thing I want to say. There's a lot more to say, but thank you so much. I just want to say I, I I loved your paper and I feel so much love for you. Thank you. And I'm not quite sure why I'm so moved, but you're, you it was such a combination of intellect and ex, your own direct experience and grounded, heartful uh, wholeness. 
in your paper that for me it was this experience of wholeness and your culture and um, not intellectualized in a way that I felt distanced from that felt so powerful and um, as a professional who has come to the work through a very direct experience path and a learner who learns through direct experience, I felt your voice was so powerful in that arena in advocating for patients um, and speaking to the power of being who you are as a professional um, that embodies so much power and so much passion that um, we need. So thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. I just really want to thank you for your heart. Truly. And thank you for that fiery heart that you have. That um, I also worked in the early psychosis world and I worked in it for seven years trying to change it from within and make it more progressive and bring in hearing voices groups and all of that. And it broke my heart. Like I call it, like I, I, I burn out. But everyone's really just broken hearted. Mm -hmm. And um, know how tough that world is seeing them treated so young and pathologized so young. And then a family also. And I you know, work with them many years later after they've left the early psychosis programs and how lasting the effects of that kind of pathologization so young has on their lives. Um, and so thank you for recognizing that and not losing that fire in your heart to keep carrying on to all these different environments. I just, yeah, I want to talk more with you. And thank you so much. You're an absolute legend. That was riveting. It was fascinating. I knew nothing about Artie Lang. And you brought him to life for me. You made him feel real. He was one of your heroes, and now you've become one of mine through this talk. Thank you. Like I said, I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> but um, so I have been very blessed over the years to meet many friends and colleagues from Ireland. And the question I often ask is, what the hell is it about the Irish? <laughs> like, fucking, um, something about Irish culture and Irish people is just, what, what, is, what is your sense of that? The alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I always get an answer like that, too. <laughs> I think there's a passion, there's always been war in Ireland, so people are prepared to give their life for a cause, and if there's a people, if that's in them, you know, there's a, it doesn't go away, I think, it comes out in poetry, and you know, there's a sorrow in Ireland too, you know, both north and south. Yeah, I asked my friend Susan McKeown about it, and she says, well, Irish culture is massively influenced globally, totally disproportionate to the actual size of Ireland and the number of people, and it has to do with the relationship to oppression and war, just like black American culture is so incredibly influential and powerful globally. So, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so reverberating with your talk and who you are. Thank you so much. Michael, I just want to say that I didn't think it was possible to love you any more than I loved you before this, but I was wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much for who you are, 
what you do and your being in the world. Thank you uh, so much for that talk. Uh, like many others are saying, I, I thought it was absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I thought you raised some really good points at the end about the uh, McDonaldization of uh, mental health and stumbling over that term. Um, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And another sort of related thing to that that I find concerning is um, just how much that way of thinking has have gotten out to the public discourse. Um, I work near uh, college, and I see a lot of young people, and I get a lot of young people coming in diagnosing themselves. You know, the most popular ones right now are ADHD and autism. Um, I get a lot of people bringing that up with me, and I do think a lot of it's spread over social media, you know, there's a lot of TikTok videos like, you know, the, that feeling when you're on the spectrum and you're socially anxious. <laughs> like, most of us are socially anxious. Um, I, I don't really know what to do about that, but I do find it um, you know, very, very concerning. And I've also had experiences working with these young people where they, they do go out and successfully get the diagnosis. And, you know, they'll give me the assessment, it's like very much so on the border, but then after that, you know, every issue is attributed to like, oh, that's my ADHD. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it's challenging as a clinician. So, yeah, I'm not making great solutions, but uh, it, it, that definitely brought it to mind. The, the whole concept of ADHD keeps me awake at night. Uh, and the links with um, difficulty in, in later life, but, the McDonaldization piece was because I, I, so when I research I'm very into grounded theory so I'll go into the study not knowing what I'm going to find and what I was interested in was how clinicians deal with suicidal ideation when you're pretty sure they're not going to act out on it and what I discovered accidentally was that senior clinicians were no longer prepared to take clinical risk so they said things like uh, yeah, I saved that person's life 20 years ago, but I wouldn't take that risk today. I.e. The, 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 the McDonaldization, the fear of uh, retribution and accountability to tick boxes and you didn't fill in the risk report, you went around to their house, why did you do that? They said that was too great to take the clinical risk. And that's where sort of a lot of the, the McDonaldization uh, came out. So uh, I thought that was particularly troubling. So Meg, then Australia, then Will. I was in a situation at the University of Chicago Hospital um, that is exactly what you described, in which I was told I was a patient, and I was told that I was going to have a meeting with a very important psychiatrist. And I thought this meeting was alone. But right before I was to go in, and since I had a father who was continually analyzing me as I grew up, um, I said, well, all right, I'm about to go in and meet with someone who probably will remind me of my father. And the person taking me in said, oh, there are all kinds of fathers in there. And I quickly thought, what does that mean? And I better come up with something positive to say about what I want in life and what I enjoy right now. Mm. So I, I put that to myself as I walked in. And I walked into the room, and it was exactly what you described. The important psychiatrist was sitting on a chair. There was a long table. And around it, in a horseshoe, there were at least 80 would-be psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, whoever they were, standing. That's it. 
I was standing. He was sitting. And I was asked these questions, which I answered, because he thought the best thing would be if I went into a six-month psych unit, a temporary one. And I thought to myself, if I do that, I'll never, ever get up. Then he wanted to know if there was anything about my life I liked. So I talked about sledding with my kids. I talked about dancing. I just came up with some things that I do love. And then this conference was over, and I left the room. And it turned out that I didn't get put in the six-month facility. But I needed a job to go out and get a job and find a place to live, or else I was still going to the six-month facility. So I went out, and I got a job in a dry cleaner. And I approached everybody I knew at the University of Chicago. And I found a room with three other women. And so I did not get sent to this six months facility. But what you describe and, and the heart of it is so, I mean, I can see it all exactly. And always can if I ever, if it ever comes to mind. Um, I had no idea I would become, I would get into this field because I couldn't stand this field because of my upbringing and these experiences. So I would really wish to thank you for illustrating, for actually, rather than simply giving us all of this language, which I struggle with, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't know the lingo, and um, what you have done for me is you've made the lingo, you've made some of the psych lingo, you've illustrated it in ways that I can take in some of that lingo. Plus, I feel very much reached, and I thank you from the depth of my heart for your compassion, and your willingness to listen. Thank you. Thank you a million. It was great. And I love the way you started talking about the sentence, the open heart, uh, Lang saying, we need open heart, right? Yeah. yeah. Not, okay. not open mindedness, open heartedness, which I love. Exactly. Yes. And then, uh, you end throwing the paper into the air. And between this, there are words, and what I think is that we need words. Um, it's difficult because the experience is the most important, but still we need words, we need narratives, we need myths, we need to talk to people. And I love what you did, because we need words. We could go to the thugs, but we need words. And that's what you did. And it's difficult to find words to tell your story. So what you did, it's perfect, really perfect. And I think that what, that's my question. It's about uh, good humor. Because in the worst case scenario, the worst case tragedy, where you cannot do anything about it, it's just happening and you cannot do anything, maybe still you can have some good humor. And that may be a lot. Yeah, that's my question. What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I've always felt humor is the greatest diagnostic. So uh, I believe that the optimum state of mind is a supple and relaxed one. 
So when the mind starts to get taut and tight, everything gets much more difficult. Then I draw the parallel between a religious extremist and someone who is in the throes of a psychotic state. There's not a lot of joking about what it, what's been believed in, and it gives a good indication. But there's no greater pleasure than seeing someone you've been working with crack a smile. And there's an even greater experience is when it's witnessed by their own family. Because it can get very dark and into the abyss. So uh, I think humor is the flash of hope as the mind starts to, to loosen up. But I think, you know, of everything that I have been taught by my patients that I've had the privilege to work with, it is patience. But it takes a lot of confidence because uh, where my research interests went was our therapists now conditioned to think they should be doing something when actually what I believe people need is not doing, but being, being with together, a personal connected encounter. And uh, the question I have is, can, can you teach that? Or does it just come from, from a long uh, experience of understanding others and, and, and what, what works really well. But, but yeah, humor, obviously, as you, you met me, humor is very important. And I don't get, I, I get very attentive, but I feel I can bring my personality into uh, the place. And also, I, so I do these very intense, complex drama groups. And it doesn't take long to, you know, people turn up kind of devastated and they've been through the system and you can get cohesiveness in the group and humour is a, a part of it and we see people who have come with, with the, these experiences central to their life and then just the space comes through with humour it's really important yeah. connectedness and counter humanity you know yeah thank you I really like that question that you asked can it be taught because it's about the being, not the doing. And um, so I have a number of people that come to me over the years, um, young people, and they might say, well, how do I become a therapist? Or what do you think about my career or this school or that school? And um, so this question comes to my mind, well, you know, is it really about who they are as a person or is it something that can be taught and trained? And so I the, where I've come to recently has been encouraging people um, to do volunteer work. So be in, a, be in a situation, be involved with AA, become a sponsor of AA, volunteer for a hopefully non-coercive suicide line, do some kind of volunteer um, hospice work, get into the role of this career you're imagining, and then see whether it actually feels like a calling just based on who you, who you are. Um, and then I think we can maybe if we are in situations where we have to hire people, we can really be in a better understanding of who they are already before they start the profession, rather than this idea that it's going to be like learning to be an auto mechanic. You don't have the skills, you go to school, you get the skills. There has to be something there in your personhood to begin with. So I'm just wondering what you, what you think about that. Because if we are serious about so-called transforming systems, I think a lot of the clinicians just need to get the hell out or go work somewhere else or put in a desk job or I don't know what, but... Yeah, uh, I think the, um, when I compare it to the UK, I think uh, therapists, I believe, get much more molded into being a therapist, you know, they've got process groups and uh, there's a different sort of style of, uh, I think, engagement and supervision in my observation in America is, can be very book, you know, so it's, it's, you know, you do the exams, you get your license, but actually, that doesn't really say much other than you, you know, so I think the more people can have um, proper encounters with people uh, would certainly shape them better than not. But I have concern, I mean, uh, the, when somebody says somebody's a therapist, that is a broad spectrum, broad spectrum. 
the capacity to take risk. I, I, I literally say to the people, this is where you can scream. And the stories I hear of when they have attempted to scream and, th and then they're sent to hospital, it's like, uh, how, can they, how can they trust anyone to let that, 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 that out? So I put it up as an invitation right away and you can just see the kind of relief and then the trust and but not all uh therapists can work with those states and and hold and you know uh, it's nearly like they want to push it away and not look in so yeah i think consideration needs to be given to how therapists are trained definitely um i think we're running out of time uh and I have two questions, so I'm only going to ask one. But first, I'd like to recognize the storyteller archetype that you own so well. What's the Irish word for it? Shanaki. Shanaki. So you're a Shanaki? For my patients, sir. Love it. So um, 27 years ago, when I graduated the residency program, just starting out in a private practice, I was going to do this holistic psychiatry, which I had no idea what that was. Really, I was. Yeah, this motto popped into my mind. I'd rather teach a skill than prescribe a pill, da, 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 but I will. And so um, as I listen um, and don't know a lot about RD land because I'm new to it, it's, it sounds in the anti-psychiatry movement and uh, that there's kind of a black and white view about psych meds. And I wonder uh, how he thought about psych meds. Are they all bad? And I'm wondering about your experience over the course of your career in di four different places, five different places, with psych meds and whether you think they have any value at all uh, in the treatment of acute psychotic, you know, psychotic states. Nice, easy question. <laughs> So I think, um, I well, my motto would be whatever gets you through the night. I, th I think, Mike is the expert, you know, I think Ronnie's view was, it wasn't against it. I think it was more of the coerce of use than the shutting down. So I think, uh, I've never met anyone who's said, fuck me, these neuroleptics are great, do you want to try one? <laughs> never, right? Which sort of makes me go, hmm. I haven't seen great results at all in four countries. I, I've, it feels like it's more a pill to uh, reduce the anxiety of the professionals than it is to help the individual. However, there, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a lottery for some people to get the right med and it can be very beneficial. My issue is, why are you leaving people on these meds indefinitely? You could take an average intelligent person off the street and ask what they think of polypharmacy and they go, why can somebody be on all these drugs to do it? It doesn't take a clinician. So I, oh, oh it's gone. It's gone. Okay. Hear me? I always push for review. So part of the advocacy work I would do was uh, contacting the psychiatrist and asking them to review. These people don't want to, they're, they're not trained uh, critically. So when I trained in the UK, uh, it was all about deconstructing the DSM. So when I came to America, I had to learn how to reconstruct it because I had to diagnose. And I had to be creative about my diagnosis because um, everyone needs one to get it, so to get working, but you don't want it to become a label. Um, so I believe the research, uh, more and more research is highlighting the toxicity. What is the long-term effect of the toxicity? And I think, I believe the research supports the view that for some people uh, it's, it's much better in the short term, but the outcomes for people who are just left on meds indefinitely, um, uh, not so good. The problem is pe people aren't really trained to be critical, so they trust the doctors in what they're giving them, you know, so sometimes it often it can be a difficult territory to do the advocacy work uh, and sometimes I take drastic measures so uh, you know the open dialogue I don't know how, how you're familiar with it it just takes somebody to, a prescriber to enter that space 
and they're as brutal as any other situation. You know, I've been in situations where someone has said, uh, I was concerned about them snorting Xanax and uh, Ritalin, right, and they were on neuroleptic. And there was a huge fight with the chief medical officer, myself, and the prescriber. And they came to this meeting and said to the uh, family, your son's more likely to die of schizophrenia than he is of snorting Ritalin. And, and how my activism in that was, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, see the family anymore because it's just about collaboration. But the activism point, part was that goes through the organization. Why is, why, why are you not working that? Because the prescribing is so bad and brutal and lacks compassion and common sense. Um, so I went around houses there a little bit. It's, I think it's multifaceted, but I think the research, I mean, people probably know more than me, but I think short term it can have some benefits. But my issue is non-reviewed leaving people on meds indefinitely. And I see a lot of people whose complex trauma is at the hands of the psychiatric world, you know, lifetime in care. Sandy, then John. Uh, I wondered, uh, thank you. And the accent is everything, I have to tell you. Very well delivered. As to your question about can you train this? I think you're doing that right now by being present the way you are, mm -hmm. by being in the room the way you are. Mm -hmm. And when you work with students, which I hope you'll be doing, that's the way you train it. Mm -hmm. Just in the way you present it, being with them. You know, when um, I teach graduate classes, you know, and uh, you know, for a master's degree in counseling and stuff like that. Uh, first thing I would say to the students on the first day, I'd say, so you're all here, you want to join this tribe of people that claim to be therapists, whatever that is. And I said, look around the room and ask yourself this question. Who in this room would you refer somebody you really cared about to? Keep that in mind for the entire class. I just like to ground it in their personal experience. And it sounds like that's what you like to do as well. I think that's great. Keep up the good work, Mike. Yes. You're a beautiful soul, Michael. And a role model to everybody. I guess uh, the reincarnation of, uh, of Lang and Carl Rogers uh, uh, tied into one, maybe. Um, but I wanted to, um, yeah, amplify a bit on, on Gary's concern about meds and, and also uh, Will's. Um, I'll get around to ask you about your grassroots approach. Um, but. Not all therapists are the same. Of course they're not. You know, you have to have a certain way of being. And you, you personify that. Um, a lot of people go in the, in the profession for the wrong reasons. And we know it. I mean, you, you think you're going to help somebody, but really you're there because you're fucked up and you want to, you know, you want to try to figure things out. Um, uh, but, but there's a, I, I think the, the training program is uh, so different uh, per, you know, wh whatever your you know program you enter into, and you can't help but um, be exposed to the politics of mental mental health and mental illness. So especially in America, where, and it's the same way in Canada, that everything is about the medical model, and it has a presupp presupposition that everything. Uh, boils down to the brain. So all the complexities of being a human being, their personality, uh, having um, you know internal psychic conflict, it's all chalked up, symptoms all chalked up to uh, a brain state is out of whack and if we can give a chemical it will realign it. And the public 
have been gaslighted into thinking that that's true. And, and also the transference that's so operative and, uh, where people are, are desperate, they, they look to the physician as you know a God figure and with that hope that the medicine's gonna make them feel better. Uh, very, uh, very few also uh, are interested in exploring the underlying dynamic conflicts that they go through because it's painful. And if that fantasy, the transference fantasy, is is it, it all fueled by anything, whether it be medicine, pharmacology, uh, the public, peer groups, it's very difficult to break through. Um, but I do want to distinguish between severe, severe or extreme states and uh, more functional forms of uh, suffering. So I. When I started my career, I, as a clinical psychologist, I worked in three, three psychiatric hospitals, three different ones, um, two in the United States and one in Canada. And they're just um, warehouses, really. Um, and and you, this is the only game in town, so you have to, you have to integrate yourself within uh, a, a medical model. And there's always a pecking order. Psychiatrist is the top. Psychologist gets a second seat. Social worker and below are, you know, third-class citizens. And uh, it's tough uh, to fall in into that because you're anyone who's not on the tier and is not taken as seriously. Um, but you find your own ways to interject your views, and particularly if you you know, have a certain status, you, you can extra, exercise your, your point of view without consequences. Um, but the, the, you know, let's say, what, for lack of a better word, the, the psychotics um, are all medicated and they may, need, they may need to have that to help them transition into a better life at the same time providing you know, quality psychological care. But when, when I shifted to private practice, everybody came in medicated already. Family doctors in Canada will prescribe any kind of, uh, you know, psychotropic for anything. And this gets to the grassroots thing. Uh, so, and I, I, I retired from clinical practice during the pandemic. And by that time, uh, 2008 to 2021, I had not taken on a new patient at that point. Uh, my, my caseload, in fact, had one patient I had seen for 20 years. And every single patient that I had seen over, over that period of time, by the time, you know, Oh, you know, maybe a year or two, some no longer, they had all weaned off their medications. And so my approach was the only thing I have control over is the dialogue I have with, the, with my clients and getting them to see the value of, of getting off the medications and, um, and letting, you know, letting the natural healing process occur. So that was, the only, that was my contribution to the grassroots is to encourage them to go off, maybe a little bit at a time, even if I had no contact at all with their doctors, because they, they would just simply tell them to stay on it. And, and so how do, you, how do you introduce a, a broader grassroots movement? So it's a good question. I, I, I'm making strategic links as part of the rebellion. Uh, and one of the initiatives is uh, called the Inner Compass Initiative. And they are developing um, grassroots support groups to help people taper off meds. So instead of someone attempting this uh, alone, they're getting really uh, intelligent thinking about it and support. Uh, my experience with psychiatrists uh, in America is when you ask to taper off the meds, they put you on more meds. 
where they change the men's I, it's it's near like I could put it in an envelope as a prediction when someone goes and you know give an example I was supporting somebody taper went on holiday came back and they were trying to taper off an anti-anxiety medication and they came back and they were on a stimulant and it was like 12 months of work to support the person until they're they're ready to choose themselves this was their own initiative to come off so in that case uh i use some irish language to the psychiatrist like what the fuck are you doing <laughs> <laughs> and i find that that sort of transcends the hierarchy a little bit because in a way they're so conditioned to not think you know, the, the, it was actually the patient said something about ADHD. He's in his 50s. And they just, oh, yeah, I'll just write a script for that. And then you're wondering why he's bouncing off the walls. So I um, I was joking about, like, I absolutely do the opposite. I kiss arse. That's my advocacy work. I form relationships where I can contact them and try and work collaboratively and they'll listen. Um, so I think, uh, in the talk I said, I don't think you can take this uh, situation on head on. I think you need it, the grassroots support. The best news that I've heard in a long time is, in America, litigation cures everything. There's already stories emerging in the major press about deaths by polypharmacy. And again, an average person looks at, why is someone on that range of so I think the more uh, litigation you get, I think um, the more you'll get sort of uh, a more motivated grassroots approach. Um, so yeah. Well, I told you while we were saving the best for the last, and uh, I think that's definitely been happening. Uh, Will, you were asking earlier about is that there's what's with the deal with the Irish? And uh, my Irish grandmother told me it's the gift of the gap. Mm. <laughs> That's exactly what we saw today. Oh, okay. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so I, um, I put on a peace conference in, in Belfast last December. And I, I'm not artistic, but I can find uh, artists and designers who can sort of m meet me in the space of mind and they can sort of create a vision so uh, this designer calls this my house style so what I did for the Belfast co uh, conference we took images from the troubles and then put them in this sort of style so it made it a little bit softer and a little bit iconic uh, and the reason I wanted to do it here was sometimes the, the sort of black and white photographs of line can look a bit scary or whatever uh, this is a contemporary representation, and I feel it speaks to his relevancy. That's beautiful. Uh, I know Nita was hoping during the break to figure out how to take this up on the wall, so we could take a look at it, maybe do a photo with all of us later on.